Hey everyone, thanks for sharing part of your day with us. Welcome to Skill Up in 15 Minutes. I'm Ross Ben Wyke, an account executive. And I'm Caleb Malik, account executive turned marketing director. On Skill Up in 15 Minutes, we talk with individual contributors, those folks who are carrying the bag every single day. You're going to hear one actionable tactic that you can use today and career wisdom that you can use to grow your career tomorrow. Awesome. And today we have Chris Harrington, who is an account executive at DataSite. Chris, we know when it comes to building a sales career, uh, you have to think about the quick wins in the short term and ways that you can grow your career in the long term. Uh, that's why we're excited for you to teach us today about the importance of knowing the value of what you sell and any advice you have for setting yourself up in a long, successful career in sales. Chris, how are we doing today? Good, Ross. Thanks for having me. Caleb, good to, good to chat again. Yeah, it's Absolutely. good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, man. It's great to have you back. All right. So Chris, let's jump into your one actionable tactic, uh, knowing the value of what you sell. So I want to kind of preface this with the, the problem that I think I see with a lot of sales professionals in the industry. And, and I think the, the main problem I see is that most reps are underperforming. And I think a lot of the reps that are doing so, they don't really understand the value of what they're actually selling in the market. And I think a big part of that comes from, you know, a lot of us have worked with salespeople that are from various different backgrounds. No one, I think that I know of anyways, decided they wanted to get into sales when they were in college and that's what they went for. Um, a lot of people just end up in sales and it's, it's a very good career, um, but people don't necessarily have the background in um, wanting to get into sales. And they also don't have the industry expertise of what they're selling into. You might be selling you know, let's say when I worked at HubSpot, I was selling marketing software, but I had never actually worked with any marketing professionals prior to that role. Um, so there's a little bit of a mismatch as far as understanding what you're selling and who you're selling to. Um, so I want to kind of preface it there as far as like, there's a, there's a little bit of uh, an experience gap that you're not going to mm -hmm. have right away. Um, and knowing the value of what you sell and knowing who you're selling to is really going to help you as far as um, being successful in your sales career as you get started. Yeah, that's a really good point. I guess let's walk through your experience. Um, you said at HubSpot, you'd never sold marketing software before. So, you know, how does somebody go about understanding, you know, their industry or who they sell to so they know the value of what the solution means to that person or that buyer? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think a lot of it you would hope would come in a training and onboarding program, but it, it really depends on the company, right? I mean, Ross, you and I have a lot of startup experience and a lot of it's kind of trial by fire. So you don't necessarily have an onboarding program that's really getting you into understanding who you're selling to and kind of the day-to-day -day and the value propositions. I will say one thing that I, I enjoyed when I was at HubSpot uh, for my first year in sales, they had a really good training program part of that training program was building out buyer personas. So I think that's mm. a really important uh, concept to grasp as far as like literally making that persona, writing it out. Uh, we used to do this when I was, I moved on to a company Medaxo where I was an account executive. We would whiteboard out, here's the people that we're selling to. Mm. Here's what they actually care about. And here's what they're doing on a day to day. And this is the value that our solution provides each individual person. So we would actually map out, this is the person, this is what they're doing, and here's the value that we provide them. So I think it's, it's good to kind of take a step back and really understand who you're selling to, what their motives are, what they're doing on a day-to-day, -day, and really kind of get, get some eyes into what they're doing. Otherwise, you're, you're having a mismatch as far as, you're, it's, it's harder to build rapport. You don't really know what they're doing on a day-to-day, -day, and then you're trying to sell a solution that you don't even know what value it drives. So it, it makes it very difficult to be successful in sales and solve problems, which is really what sales is at the end of the day. If you don't know the problems that these people are going through, then you're not going to be able to help solve them. Yeah, yeah I think that's a – oh, Caleb, I was about to tee you up as a marketer. I'd love to hear yeah. your perspective on uh, you know buyer personas and how, how you can enable a salesperson to use those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the folks in marketing are often going to be putting together those, yeah, like you said, buyer personas that are going to help you understand a lot of those questions. Um, and that was actually going to be kind of my my uh, my question to Chris is, you know, let's say that you don't have a marketing department who's going to be handing off those buyer personas that help you basically get the information you would need to do that mapping. What are maybe some ways that, uh, you know, if you're talking to a young SDR, you know, somebody who's just getting started and they're like, you know, I don't know my buyer that well. I don't know the you know, problems that we solve, but I want to, and I want to do this mapping that Chris just talked about. Where would you recommend going to find that information and gather that information to, to place within that map? 
I'd say HubSpot, again, has a lot of good resources on building out buyer personas and buyer persona templates. Um, a couple of other pieces of advice I would give uh, is actually getting in front of your customers uh, in any way that you can and having kind of a natural curiosity about them mm -hmm. uh, as you're going through the sales process, especially when you're early on. Like It's okay to explain to people that you are new and you're still learning uh, and you want to better understand their business. That way you can help solve their problems with your solution. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's okay to do that. Uh, it's okay to let people know that you are new and that you're trying to ramp up and find ways to help them. Uh, another thing I, I would recommend as well, a, a lot of successful salespeople I see, they take a lot of initiative. So it would be good to go and sit with other, other departments such as product or marketing and, and actually learn from them as far as what they're, what they're seeing, the kind of messaging they're putting together and what's resonating with customers. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so I think that speaks a little bit to, uh, you know, Ross's question of buyer personas, which is, you know, some of the things that they're putting together. Right. And so you may have some of that formal documentation. Um, when you talk about sitting with other teams, what does that typically like, what does that look like? Like, what are kind of those steps? Like, do you, do you get time on somebody's calendar? Or are you like shadowing? Like, what's that look like? Yeah, it's interesting. Some companies have entire roles that are dedicated to kind of this rotational leadership and sitting in in each department to better understand the company and to better understand the people that you're selling to. Um, I would recommend taking the initiative to scheduling additional time outside of your training to just sit with different departments, uh, message people, network with people. Um, now that we're all kind of getting back to the offices here and there too, uh, go and, and grab coffee, grab lunch with people in different departments outside of sales. Um, th those are your sales support people, whether it be marketing, sales engineers, customer service. And, you know, it's always good to just pick their brain. Um, they've probably been around there longer than you have. They've talked to more customers uh, if you're a newer uh, salesperson. And even see if you can shadow on some of the calls with customers to hear how things are resonating and, and what value we're actually providing in the solutions we sell. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I wouldn't want to put words in your mouth, but I think, you know, buying somebody in marketing or buying somebody in, you know, whatever department lunch to, you know, somebody who's been a little bit more senior, been there a little bit longer is probably a pretty, you're gonna get a pretty good return on that investment, I would think. Absolutely. Yeah, I would highly recommend that. It, buy people lunches, sit down, and, and even some of the prospects and clients you work with, you know, if you can take people out to lunch, it, it doesn't always have to be you're either closing them or you're not. What are some other things like benefits of being able to do that? Like, do you leave less money on the table? Do you have shorter deal cycles? Like, wh what are your thoughts around some of that stuff, Chris? Yeah, I think it starts with just building credibility for yourself. And I, I don't think people buy from you unless they know and like you, they know and like your company, and they know and like your product. Um, so if you don't get those three buckets checked, people are not going to buy from you, period. So I think it's a crucial, it's a crucial part for any sales process is being able to understand what people are doing and how your solution ties to their day-to-day -day business objectives. Um, as far as that, I would say a lot of people I've seen who struggle with this, they end up negotiating with themselves in the sales process. I think we've all mm -hmm. seen it where, you know, you don't really know the value of what you're providing. And then before you know it, you're like, oh, you know, I got the sales call. Uh, this guy's probably going to pick me apart on price. So I'm going to, I'm going to lower, you know, he's probably going to want better terms. And before you know it, you've already done the negotiating for your prospect, right. On their behalf mm -hmm. before you've even gotten on the phone with them. So if you don't know the value of what you're selling, it's very easy to diminish the uh, the return and diminish the just the entire solution that you sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. So I think you can do right by yourself by understanding the value of what you sell, not only um, you know to make bigger commission checks and to sell bigger deals, <laughs> but also to better help your buyers and also uh, foster you know better professional relationships um, within the organization that you work. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, we all we all see that, right? In sales organizations, there's always a, a handful of people that aren't performing and they might lower, you know, they find a way to win, right? That's what salespeople do. And that might lead to lowering the price as low as possible to win a deal where we're not really demonstrating any value. We're just winning kind of almost like a commodity. We're just winning with the lowest price, best price wins. Uh, mm -hmm. And that can really diminish the uh, entire value of all of the sales motion and the product that you're selling. Uh, and I will clarify as well, you don't have to be an expert in the industry, right? Like you don't need to know everything there is to know about uh, marketing. If you're selling into marketing as a sales rep, um, you just need to know enough to be dangerous. You need to know enough about the day-to-day -day and the objectives and what those people are doing and how your solution helps. You don't have to be a marketing expert. Mm -hmm. So I just want to add that clarification there. I think it's really important. Yeah, I think it can be discouraging for people who feel like they, you know, if they hear this, they're like, oh, man, I, I got to go learn about like all the different marketing stuff out there. And, and at the end yeah. of the day, it's about educating yourself enough to speak their, 
their language. Um, one thing you said uh, a moment ago, which I think, uh, you know, we talk about knowing the value and we talk about some ways to, to know the value. Um, I think on the, the back end of that is not, it doesn't matter what you know, it's what you demonstrate. And you said that phrase of like demonstrating the value, um, which, you know, you, you can know the value all you want and that's important, but you got to demonstrate it. So what does that look like for you? Like, how do you go about doing that? Whether it's in like your slide decks or your demos or whatever it might be, like, how do you lay that out? What's your structure and kind of maybe framework for, for doing that for your, uh, your buyer? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I actually, I wrote this down as something I wanted to cover, which is uh, when I go into a demo and, and to even preface before that, I think the discovery call is the most important part of the sales process and understanding, you know, if I'm talking to you, Caleb, and I'm trying to sell you uh, a marketing solution, uh, since you're a marketer, I'm selling you, you know, our, our marketing um, automation software. I need to understand what challenges do you have? What are you using today? Like, what are the challenges with that? I need to better understand kind of the lay of the land for Caleb into his mind and what he's doing on a day to day. And I think that really comes down to a, a very tight discovery call, uh, understanding your business objectives, understanding your goals for this fiscal year. Uh, when you're looking to maybe make a change, do you have budget? Who else needs to be involved? There's a lot of, a lot of those critical elements that I think can easy, easily be skipped over if you're an inexperienced rep um, mm -hmm. that need to be highlighted. Another thing that I do, so once I've kind of identified, you know, here's Caleb's motives, here's the ways that we can help him. I've got him excited to maybe get on a demo as a second call. I've always written out in a framework uh, three columns before every demo. The first column is the challenge. What was the challenge that Caleb told me that he has on a day to day? The second column is here's the feature that I want to highlight that's actually going to acknowledge and help him with that challenge. And then the third column is what's the value of that feature specifically to help Caleb's challenge. So, right, Caleb is tired of sending, uh, you know, individual emails uh, in his marketing campaigns, or he has a tough time of segmenting the different leads that are in the marketing CRM. Uh, the feature I'm going to show him is our, you know, smart lists that we can easily create and easily segment uh, the specific audience we want to market to. The value of that is, you know, Caleb, we're going to save you a couple of hours, it sounds like, per day from having to manually build out lists for who you're going to market to. So three columns, challenge, feature, and value. I do that before every single demo, uh, and I map out what I learned on the discovery call and what I'm going to highlight on the demo. Love that because I think it makes it really easy for your buyer to to see how things align. I know when when I was selling marketing services, I would do a similar thing of like, hey, here's what I heard in terms of you know our previous discussion in terms of you know you're having the, this problem or this challenge or you have these goals. Here's what you're trying to hit in terms of leads or what you're trying to hit in terms of revenue. Um, and then you know having a leader, you know we would use slide docs because obviously I wasn't doing a demo. But then in a later slide saying, hey, remember those things that we talked about and those things that you said? Yeah, those are my problems. And yeah, this is exactly what my goal is. Um, here's, here's each of these laid out and here's all of the different activities that are going to speak to that thing next to it so that you can clearly see how these two things align so that it's not just like, yeah, I think creating content's great, but like, I kind of forgot why we're doing that. I just, I just know people right. said that's a good idea. Right. So I see you doing a similar thing there in terms of how you map out your demos. And I love, I love the tip because that's something anybody can do. Anybody who's listening to this can go, I got to create three columns. I got to do this, 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 right. It's just a matter of like executing, which, you know, sometimes people don't do. Right. But. And it doesn't matter what industry we're, we're using marketing automation, just as an example, but like Ross, you and I have been at a number of different companies selling and selling roles. And I would say this applies at every company, no matter what industry you're selling into. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely agree. And I, I uh, agree with Caleb. Like I really like that um, the three columns approach that you're using. I think that's a really simple and uh, repeatable, uh, you know, framework that people can use. Uh, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. So um, loving the tips. Uh, as, we, as we highlighted in the beginning, we think it's important for people to have the things that they're doing today and they can go and they can implement them you know, tomorrow and start you know, improving their sales. But we also want to leave people with you know, the things that they're thinking about long term. You know, what, how do they run their career and you know, career wisdom from folks who have been there like yourself? We'd like to hear a little bit about your career and just kind of those career changes and how you got into sales, um, how you made your transitions in sales. I understand you were doing, um, you, you were an entrepreneur uh, really in the beginning, um, uh, long before you were in a formal uh, sales role. Uh, so tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think like most people in a sales career, I, did, I didn't pick sales. I wasn't, <laughs> you know, out to go to college to become a salesman like most people. And 
I think it's unfortunate too, because a lot of people look at sales as like this death of a salesman, like tragic ending to a career. But um, I'm glad that I fell into sales. And really the way that I fell into sales was I was trying to get my first job in high school and I didn't have any experience. And I had a mentor of mine that told me, Hey, do you have a lawnmower in your garage? And I was like, uh, well, yeah, I, you know, parents cut the lawn. It's like, well, classic. Why don't you, <laughs> exactly. Why don't you go and cut some lawns and start a business? And, you know, long story short, it turned into a three year venture for me with, um, you know, working in six different cities and towns, 25 clients, uh, pretty solid book of business. Um, and that kind of sp sparked really a passion for me to go into entrepreneurship and go to business school. So ended up going to community college, um, got into um, a couple different sales roles after I had transferred to business school, went to Babson College, um, ended up getting into HubSpot and phenomenal training program, started me off as a BDR. Um, the way I got into HubSpot was interesting as well, where I did a, it was called a management consulting field experience. We, uh, HubSpot basically came to our college and said, hey, we have a business problem. We're going to hire some college students. They'll get credit for helping us. And the challenge was, how do we find talented sales reps that are graduating from college and get them into our business? So I helped put together a presentation and, you know, a semester's worth of work. And at the end of it, I said, hey, uh, I might be interested in being one of those people. So I uh, ended up getting in that way. And um, long story short, I've been in sales ever since. Yeah, uh, I, I dig that. And I think that that's something that, you know, people might hear that and think, um, oh, well, you know, he was a student at the time. And so that that applies to maybe students and not to me. Um, but I think one thing that people often overlook is just you never know what the connections are that you're going to make. You never know the people you're going to. Um, I'm sure I'm sure you didn't do a crappy job on that project, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Right. <laughs> Even though it was just the one the one project, you know, some company that. Um, you know, may not have been, you know, all that, you know, they, they were large, but they weren't, you know, the, the massive company they are today. And for uh, the folks who are uh, listening in, um, what, where were they at at that point when you when you joined HubSpot? What was the size of the company? I want to say they were around 2000 employees, if I had to get uh, one, one to 2000 employees. So we still had kind of a startup feel, but we were a publicly traded and pretty large company at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So already pretty large. And I think, you know, I didn't want to dive in too deep uh, earlier in the discussion because I knew we'd get to it here, but you had mentioned the training piece, which I think is really important. Um, you know, if you're a brand new SDR, you haven't done it before, um, you are going to have maybe some more roadblocks. So do you feel like the fact that they were at that size and that they had that training, like, and that's a dumb way to phrase it. Of course, you thought it was valuable. Um, but, you know, I think how, how valuable is that and how much uh, value should uh, folks put on that? You know, they're going into their first SDR role and they have to choose between the small startup uh, that maybe doesn't have a whole lot of training or the HubSpot, you know, that is going to have that for them. Right. Um, how, how much weight do you give to that? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I, I think it really comes down to knowing yourself and, and what's going to fit your profile best. Like some people just thrive in startup environments better than they do in large organizations. And um, in that aspect, maybe it's better to learn trial by fire. I think you learn well in both scenarios. And, you know, if you're, if you're passionate about being successful in sales, you're going to find a way to win no matter what, whether that's through the fire of wins and losses, or whether that's through a very structured training program, I think you can learn from both and neither scenario uh, neither scenario hurts as far as starting your career. Um, you're you're going to learn from the people around you regardless. Um, there's going to be people more senior, more tenured. You can learn from the executives in the company. Uh, no matter what route you go, um, I think you're going to learn and, and you can be good in sales either way. It's just about knowing yourself and what fits you best, right? Don't take the job that, that makes the extra $5,000. Take the job you're more excited and more passionate about. Okay. So you're saying training is helpful, but at the end of the day, take the job that you're more passionate about because you're going to be more driven to either invest in the training that they have or to create some training for yourself or set up those lunch meetings or whatever it might be. Yeah, absolutely. Take the one you're more passionate about and the one, maybe it's an industry that's just more exciting to you. Uh, I think excitement in sales is, is important. If you're not, if you're like you're not always going to sell something that you're super passionate about. You can be passionate about just sales in general. I, I think that's enough of a fire to be successful in this career, but it doesn't hurt to, you know, really be excited about what you're getting up and selling every day. And, and I think that would be more important than focusing on like a training program. Not to put you on the spot, Chris, but it, it sounds like you had a, a pretty unique scenario where you got that program at Babson college. And it kind of was a nice, you know, um, position to like then get you into the HubSpot. Uh, into HubSpot's door. 
if somebody doesn't have, you know, a scenario like that, but they need to understand, like, would I thrive in a startup or would I not thrive in a startup? Like, am I driven enough to, you know, learn a new industry and then, you know, learn these things on my own? Or do I need formalized training? Do you have any, like, again, not to put you on the spot, I know that we didn't tee up for this earlier or anything, but do you have any like suggestions on, on how maybe on somebody who's just getting started out might be able to learn those things about themselves? I know there's a lot of like the career and I'm actually working through this with uh, my, my cousin actually right now, he's trying to figure out what's, what's kind of the suitable career for him and, and what aspect he should go into. And I, there's a lot of those career aptitude tests. I, I think that's mm-hmm. a good way to get a better understanding of your strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think one thing that's really important too, is to talk to people and I wouldn't say your direct family, but talk to good friends who are going to kind of steer you straight on your strengths and weaknesses and ask them for an honest opinion. You know, what do you, what, do you, you know, I'm looking at these two jobs or I'm thinking about this industry. What do you think is best for me? Like, you know, me better than I, maybe I even know myself just from having been around me, give me kind of the honest the honest feedback. I think asking for people in your network for honest feedback about yourself can be really important to mm-hmm. make the right choice. And, and, you know, you can always go backwards too. You can always take a step back to take two steps forward. If you feel like you joined a company and it's not the right fit, um, there, the good thing about sales is there's always another opportunity that's out there. So you can always mm-hmm. make it a career move if it's not the right fit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I, I know that you, after you were at HubSpot, you transitioned to a smaller company. Can you tell us a little bit about like that transition, how that transpired and when you maybe knew that you were ready to make that move? Yeah, well, you, you talked about earlier the importance of, you know, kind of putting your best foot forward. And I think that's really what got me into, I ended up joining an M&A startup called Medaxo uh, from HubSpot. So I had been reached out to by the CEO and VP of sales at the time. It was a maybe 40 person company. Um, and they had, so my VP of sales at Medaxo, her husband worked at HubSpot and he worked closely with my manager and they had sort of heard that I was, you know, a real go-getter. Uh, I, I guess to put it lightly, uh, I was very aggressive, arrogant, young sales rep. <laughs> they wanted <laughs> to, to teach you a lesson. Involved. So they were like, give him an AE role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I wish. So yeah, I was very arrogant and very, uh, very driven to succeed as a BDR. And they had kind of heard that through the grapevine. They were trying to hire a 30, 40 person startup and my name got dropped and ended up doing a couple interviews. And it wasn't really that simple to be honest, just moving in from BDR to AE. I had to weigh my options as far as, you know, here I am at a well-established company HubSpot with insane growth. Like the company even today is growing uh, insanely fast. And everyone I know from there has done very well in their career. So I had to make a decision. Do I move to the startup or do I stay here and continue to grow my career? Uh, and I also, my VP of sales at the time at Medaxo, she gave me two offers. One was for a BDR role and one was for the AE role. And she basically said, I'm going to let you make this decision since you don't have any formal closing experience. And mm-hmm. you know, I think I've thought about it for maybe 10 seconds and uh, signed the offer letter to be an AE. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I want to dig into that just a little bit more. Like what... Um... What, I guess, what gave you the confidence to, like you said, HubSpot's growing insanely fast. Like it's obviously a well-known company. I mean, what gave you the confidence or like, why were you like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to give this up to go to a 40 person startup. I felt like I had the experience. I mean, there was almost a, a little bit of a tick on my shoulder that I had closed before. Like I built this lawn care company. I I did so well in college. I've I felt I was almost ready to close the day that I started at HubSpot. And I even remember talking to the recruiter on the phone where I was like, you know, is this a full closing role? Because I have experience in closing. And he kind of laughed at me. It was like, this is a BDR role. Like, you're not, you're not ready to be a closer. You just graduated. I don't know. There was a little bit of a, I think a tick in my shoulder. Where it was, I think, arrogant and <laughs> driven enough to just be confident in my ability to sell and and go to the startup and have a real impact. And and I think a lot of sales really is that it's the confidence to succeed. You're going to project that onto the world and that's just going to be the case. Uh, I think confidence goes a long way in sales and uh, in being successful in a sales career. 
Yeah, I think, you know, you you use the word arrogant a lot, but then you just use the word confidence. Um, and I think it's important to, <laughs> I think maybe you're, you're being a, like, maybe a little hard on yourself and maybe, you know, a, a little bit tongue in cheek in terms of the arrogance thing of like, you did have a reason to be confident, right? Like you had done, uh, you know, you had had the lawn care business, you had done really well in school. Um, I think if there are opportunities, you know, I think when we think, you know, the folks who are listening to this and, you know, maybe they don't feel confident. Maybe they are that BDR who's like, I don't know if I'm ready. I'm not ready. And I don't know if I'm going to get into that AE role. And I think you can build that a little bit. Like, I think you can, uh, you know, I'm sure you were probably asking and, you know, I, I probably would have like, Hey, AE, like I just booked this meeting. Can I, can I, you know, come to that meeting? Can I sit in on it? Now we, nowadays, you know, I don't think we probably had, you know, gong and that sort of thing back then. Right. But it's, you know, listening in on those calls. And I think that there's those experiences of like, you join for it or you listen to it and you're like, that's exactly what I would have asked. That's the question I would have asked. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I would have done. And it's like, oh, I can do this. Right. Um, you know, are there other ways that you maybe feel like people could build that confidence or build that kind of pre AE experience so that they feel like it's time? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great example in and of itself is like, listen to your colleagues and kind of know yourself, what, what skills, you know, you bring to the table and, and, also, you can learn a lot from, again, those more tenured people. I, I used to have lunches with people on the, I, I got moved into the corporate segment at HubSpot as a BDR. Um, and I would take people out to lunch and sit on their calls and, you know, just stay in the office late. And some of those guys worked uh, West Coast. So mm -hmm. I'd be in late doing East Coast hours. So I'd be able to hear their calls and just kind of be a, just, just absorb all the information, be a sponge really, and, and learn as much as I can. Um, I, I, I think it's a mindset. You need to just realize you can learn the skills. It, sales is a skill like anything. It's not, I think there's a little bit of an innate like ability to it, but I think a, most of it you can learn. Uh, you can mm -hmm. learn from other people by just being confident that you can learn it and be successful. Yeah, that's interesting. So how do you go about picking up, let's say that you are that, uh, that BDR who's listening to those calls. Um, how do you go about like internalizing that? Like, do you have any methods that you use beyond, I mean, I know like obviously the confidence, like I know I can learn this, but then like, how do you learn this? Like, how do you put that into action and maybe any like tips or tactics you have for folks there? Yeah, for me, I'm, I'm a pretty visual learner. So a lot of it was notes. Uh, I use Microsoft OneNote for literally everything and books I would recommend as well. Uh, there's a lot of good sales books out there, Challenger Sale, Sales EQ, uh, Chris Voss on uh, Never Split the Difference. But for me, outside of like reading books, I, I take a lot of notes. I mean, I'll literally map out like, this is how the sales rep ran the call. They'd set an agenda. Uh, they recapped the last call. Then they highlighted these three key points during the demo. And then they wrapped it up with next steps. They got additional time on the calendar. I'll literally make it into a methodology. If it wasn't a methodology and that sales rep spitballed it, I made it into a methodology and, and I found some way to put it on paper, put pen to paper and let it grasp in, in my brain to make sense. Yeah. It's almost like you can, uh, you can three call them anything, you know, as a, as a broad right, term, right. right? Like you can get yeah. that stuff written down and like, and you can tell the difference, right? Like you can tell the difference when you listen to a call with a rep who, you know, is kind of flying by the seat of their pants or maybe doesn't have much of a system. And then you can tell when you have the reps who have like their framework and they have their way of like working through things. And it's not that you need to be a robot and like, I'm going to ask this, this question, even though you just answered it two questions ago, I'll just ask it anyway, because it's next in line, but, um, and you can have it feel like a conversation, but I think sometimes people, and maybe, maybe you wouldn't agree with this, but I think sometimes people will say, um, you know, it needs to be conversational and they take that as a, as a, I'm just going to, you know, show up and run a conversation. And right. I think that's where a lot of people, you know, can, can lose their success. Yeah, there's a difference between like framework overload, like a framework is not for everybody, but also there's, a, you need to be prepared, right? Like prepared might not be a framework for everybody, but you definitely shouldn't show up to a sales call without at least some sort of an agenda in mind and what you want to get out of the call and mm -hmm. where you want that call to go. Um, so I definitely think there's a key distinction there between framework overload and being prepared. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you got to Medaxo in your, in this new AE role, how did that go for you? Like, were you like kicking ass on day one or was this like, <laughs> was there a little bit of like a, a pickup and like, what did that trajectory look like once you got there and got in that position? Yeah, just kicked ass day one. That was it. <laughs> no, <I'm> just <laughs> that's it. And the call. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> no. I think like everybody, right? There's there's a lot of challenges along the way. And um, again, I was just very driven. Like I, I still held that tick on my shoulder that you know now I'm at a new company, I'm in a closing role, but now I want to be the best closer here. And yeah, it was a challenge at first. I remember a couple of months where 
nothing was ticking. And I even have a couple of the old demos still recorded and saved on my computer where I've like listened back and I'm like, wow, like, I can't believe <laughs> I, I can't believe that guy signed the contract cool. for one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, there's, there was a long kind of trajectory of learning. And I even remember talking to my VP of sales with like key moments where I felt like, like pivotal moments for me where all of a sudden it just clicked like just mm-hmm. enough trial and error, because again, we didn't have a structured, you know, onboarding training process. It was kind of like, we're going to shadow these days. We're going to, you know, here's our personas. We've kind of, kind of think we know, mm-hmm. and it ended up changing over time. We ended up selling into a different audience uh, than we were originally. Um, but I just went in and trial by fire, man. I, I tried to learn every way I could sit on everybody's calls. We would sit in a conference room with the Jabber speaker and mute it in between and ask for help from your your peers and just close deals that that was it yeah I yeah so you mentioned the pivotal moments i'm curious to hear kind of like what were those what were like maybe one or two of those pivotal yeah. moments like what were those like when it dawned on you of like oh i get it now like I, this thing just your aha moment if you will yeah it's it's almost hard to describe i feel like you just you feel it like for me there were just certain points where i would be running a sales call and all of a sudden i was like it just feels like i'm like now I'm connecting with Caleb. Like it's just, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm past this like awkward, you know, you know, when you first start out, mm-hmm. you're kind of awkward. You don't really know the the verbiage and you're kind of like cherry picking or like repeating things that you've heard before, but you don't really know what they mean. And I was kind of doing that like, yeah, you know, M&A, this and that. And yeah, we're working on buy side, you know, companies, corp dev, they're doing a lot of buy sides mm-hmm. and you're kind of cherry picking things, but then just enough repetition, you start to actually know what it means mm-hmm. and you can start to kind of take those words and put them into your own and really drive value. Again, going back to this, like knowing the value. Now, you know, the value, now, you know how to drive the value. Like, it's not about me selling this product and just closing deals as a sales rep. It's about like, how can I demonstrate to this person that I really understand their business challenges Mm -hmm. and that I have something that's worth listening to. And I think Mm -hmm. that was one of the main key moments for me. was like, even just cold calling, like you get somebody on the phone and like, yeah, not interested. And, after a while, you're like, I have something of value here. And, and then they start to hear it in your voice, like the confidence of, you know, mm-hmm. maybe I should take this call. Like maybe this guy knows what he's talking about. And maybe it's something I can learn from him. Um, so I don't know that the, that's, it almost was like a feeling, you know, you just started to get it. And it happened a couple how, of times. How long do you think it took you to, to grasp that feeling like that, that yeah. confidence muscle? I'd say six months into the closing role was like the first and I, and to clarify, I don't think this ever ends. If you're not having these like aha moments where things are clicking, then I think you're, you're kind of getting stagnant in your career. I think you should always be getting these kind of bursts of like Mm -hmm. aha moments throughout your sales career. Um, But I'd say the first six months was probably the first one where things just started to really click for me. And then, you know, my, my numbers reflected it. And Mm -hmm. I, I would say, probably like a six month basis from there on out. I just had these moments where I felt like things like just made more sense. Like I had ascended this former version of myself in my (laughs) sales career. It sounds tacky, but it's true. You just kind of feel Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, the reason I ask is because as sales professionals, I feel like everybody's so we're always so aspirational for like the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important, you know, thinking about like career wisdom here, like things to keep in mind for, you know, young professionals starting out. It's, uh, you know, I think what we're we're talking about, it sounds like, you know, give it time to develop, uh, give yourself time to develop in the role and really to reach that, that point where you, where you've worked that confidence muscle and you can show up to those calls and confidently, you know, have that conversation because you know it, right? Um, I, you know, I think people, t- I see a lot of people move from, you know, one company to the next, you know, within a year, you know, year and a couple of months. And, you know, I'm guilty of that as well. Like, I think all sales professionals are somewhat guilty of looking for the next thing. I mean, we, we like shiny objects. Uh, we like bigger paychecks. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's easy to fall into that temptation of, of uh, you know, looking for the next role. But yeah, to your point, give it time to develop and uh, give yourself time to develop rather. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's something to be said for just honing in on the ability to sell. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're selling, just hone in on that skill. Uh, and it's not going to happen overnight. So don't expect it to, uh, mm-hmm. and don't, you don't have to jump ship in the first six months if you're not succeeding, because there's a reason why sales reps have ramps and, um, 
there's a reason why people will say sales is a very difficult career. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people lack patience and they, they want everything. You know, we're in this instant gratification kind of time era right now where everybody wants everything yesterday and it just doesn't work that way. It, you know, sales is a skill and it has to be developed with time and with effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think we're coming to full circle a little bit here because, you know, you talk about uh, throughout the conversation today, you've talked about confidence and how important confidence is. And I think some people think of like, you know, there's that TED talk that a lot of people might reference of like, you know, to get to feel confident, you can use your body and you can stand up and you can flex and that'll make you feel more confident. I'm standing right now. I don't yeah, know there you go. Are, are you flexing right now? Like, I don't no, know. No. <laughs> um, but you know, it's like, that's the sort of thing that like somebody might hear that and go like, oh, before my sales call, like I should do that. That way I come off as like more confident. Yeah. I'm like, that might help, but I think that that's like a little layer on top of like really understanding the value that you bring to the table, mm -hmm. really understanding the business, you know, that's what, because you said, you know, like I used to, you know, get the, get the, you know, phone slammed in my face sort of, sort of thing. And, you know, once I realized I have something of value here, like why are people, and they can hear it in my voice, but it's because you understood their business better. It's because you understood the value of what you sold and those sorts of things. And I think for me, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not as talented as you. So I think I had one aha moment as a sales professional. And it was, uh, it was, you know, I started uh, selling the marketing services, right? And it was like, I'd get on the line. So you guys do like paid media? Do you want to do paid media? Do you want to do SEO? <laughs> you know, like, it was like, dude, it's so yeah. bad. It's so cringy looking back on it. Um, and I, I had the realization, like I'd put together this big like package and was like all hyped about it. My boss was out. So I'm like, uh, yeah, CEO's helping me out this week. So I'll, I'm going to run it by him and see, and he's probably gonna be stoked with this like, big you know, ticket number. Right. And so I get on, he's like, so why do you have this? Why do you have this thing included? And I'm like, uh, well, uh, you know, I'm doing that thing. And he's like, yeah, I don't think you know enough about their business. You know, it's right. A, it's a, right. <laughs> exactly. And that's, a, you know, so it goes back to that. And like that, you know, that's what you said was like, I, I actually understood, you know, I understood their business. I can make a business case. And I think for me, that was the big, it was like, I need to know everything about their business. I need to understand the, like the framework. And it goes back to discovery, right? Like it's like, it's that good disco discovery, right? And if you know the value of what you're selling and if you can do a good discovery and you can understand their business, you're going to be a much better, you know, salesperson. So um, yeah. it sounds like we had a very similar uh, moment and, and you got to have a few more. So, right. Uh, yeah, that, that, and I feel like, you know, sales is obviously a, a kind of a one man sport and it can be a selfish game and very like, you know, people go into sales, they make a lot of money or at least that's their hopes. But I think sometimes you get to set that aside and really just focus on who you're selling to and, and what your what value you are providing. You've, you've got to put that first if you want to really be successful. Mm -hmm. If you're just waking up every day, like oh, I'm just going to go and make money. Like, again, people are going to they're going to feel that from you. They're going to hear that in your voice as opposed to like, I actually want to help this person solve a problem. Uh, and again, that's what sales is, is problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. Know the value, know the problem you're solving and know how to demonstrate it. Right. So I think those are, those are kind of the key things. When you have that, you have the confidence to, to close deals. Mm -hmm. um, well, we appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with us today and you have dropped some major knowledge that, uh, I hope so. All, all sales, I was gonna say young sales. I think all sales professionals. Uh, yeah, I learned something take today. Advantage of. Um, so yeah, we've, I, we've learned a lot. I'm sure people listening to this have learned a lot. Uh, final kind of thing to leave us with where, where can folks connect with you? Uh, where can they follow you? Uh, tell us where you're at. Yeah. So I would recommend on LinkedIn, reach out if you have any questions, comments, or want to just pick my brain. I'm always, uh, always happy to help. Cool. Well, if you're listening to this, you got to get in touch with Chris because he has uh, a lot of great information and is, uh, is willing to help you. So thank you again, Chris. Thanks, Thanks Caleb. Chris. Thanks, Ross.